It's 1977. Audiences are sitting down to watch an intergalactic adventure. One of good and evil, of right and wrong. Of a wise old man from an ancient race. Of a young, feisty heroine. Of a canine companion. Facing up to an evil force that seeks to dominate the universe. But enough about Star Wars, let's talk Doctor Who. As 1977 drew to a close, the show had reached its 15th season. It had come a long way from its humble beginnings in 1963, a sci-fi show conceived by BBC's head of drama, Sidney Newman, that had the modest aim of bridging the gap between grandstand and jukebox jury. By 77, the series was an institutionalised ritual and a flagship programme for the BBC. With Tom Baker firmly established in the role of the current Doctor, season 15 saw the instatement of the show's eighth producer, Graham Williams. Following a recent promotion from script editor to producer in 1975, Williams was assigned to Doctor Who in reaction to the BBC's desire to quell the backlash that the show was facing due to its increasingly violent content. He oversaw an era that was to be fraught with adversities and challenges, such as budgetary crises and significant competition in the form of a recent groundbreaking sci-fi cinema release. His time as the show's producer ended in 1980, with the cancellation of his final serial, Sharda, due to industrial action. That such a run saw his final season reach a peak audience of 16.1 million, however, is but one indication of the substantial impact that the approach he established had, as we'll later see. Throughout this video, we'll be taking a look at how Williams' era of Doctor Who acknowledged the importance of utilising genre and national identity practices to distinguish the show within a changing sci-fi landscape. Ultimately, how Williams' Doctor Who adapted in the face of developments in the sci-fi genre that consequently forced it to recognise its own unique strengths and utilise them to its advantage. But just when did this change begin? The fourth serial of Doctor Who's 15th season, The Sunmakers, first aired from the 26th of November to the 17th of December 1977. The TARDIS lands on Pluto in the far future, finding a society dominated by the bureaucratic, avaricious company who ruthlessly exploit the inhabitants with eye-watering taxes. The Doctor soon joins forces with an underground band of rebels and encourages them to rise up against the company and overthrow their oppressors. It was around the Sunmaker's air date that saw Star Wars beginning to be previewed in the UK. Its release marked a surge in audience expectations of the sci-fi genre's technical possibilities, providing significant competition for Doctor Who. The blockbuster presented a straightforward, fantasy-inspired narrative, focusing on young farm boy Luke Skywalker, finding himself on a space-faring rescue mission to save Princess Leia from the clutches of the menacing Darth Vader, and join the Rebel Alliance in their battle against the evil Galactic Empire, showcasing innovative effect sequences. Its extraordinary success marked a sci-fi boom in popular cinema. It was now a mainstream Hollywood movie genre and a hugely lucrative market for TV and film studios, reflected in an influx of releases from Battlestar Galactica and Book Rogers in the 25th century to Man from Atlantis and a revival of Star Trek. Doctor Who's latest script editor, Anthony Reid, recalled, Star Wars arrived in London. Graham and I and Tom Baker went together to a preview at the Empire in Leicester Square. We just came back green with envy, and also pretty blown away by the scale of it, and the size of it. Williams was concerned by the high standards of special effects which audiences could come to expect with the genre. Doctor Who just didn't have the money to compete. Williams' superiors echoed his sentiments, instantly asking the producer what was to be done about Star Wars coming out. Doctor Who was indeed enduring budgetary problems, much like the country. Facing inflation and the falling value of the pound, in late 1976, Chancellor of the Exchequer Dennis Healy was forced to negotiate a loan from the International Monetary Fund to bail Britain out of its financial problems in return for cuts to public expenditure. The cuts meant less money to spend, and a falling pound meant that the money was worth less. Underworld, the serial that followed the Sunmakers, faced the most significant budgetary problems as a result of this. With only enough scenery budget for one spaceship set to be constructed, the remainder of the production scenery was created through colour separation overlay, a technique still in its infancy. As a result, though Underworld was within its budget, Williams was not that proud of its quality. 
Thus, rather than striving to match the technical calibre of Star Wars, Doctor Who would have to differentiate itself and highlight its uniqueness. Herein lies William's key conclusion from viewing Star Wars. My point of view was that we didn't have the money or the expertise to do it, but neither did they have our British television strength, which is in building and creating character, and pretty quirky character at that. Williams recognised that the show's peculiar British character was, in fact, a strength when faced with the American 35mm film gloss. As a result, the show's national identity was identified as an important element to differentiate it. The Sunmakers provides us with the first distinct representation of this in its themes, narrative, and notably, its leading man. The serial provides us with a timely reflection of 1970s British economy and attitudes due to the writer Robert Holmes incorporating his frustration with the inland revenue over his taxes into the script. His fury at rising tax was commonplace, as public spending had risen to almost 60% of GDP by 1976, thus increasing the tax burden. By this point, a married man on average earnings paid about 25% of his income. Despite the sunmakers being set on Pluto, it would be hard not to notice its obvious allusions to taxation. From a P-45 return route, which leads to the undercity of the unemployed, referencing the P-45 tax form which details an employee leaving work, to gather a Hade, whose red face, bushy eyebrows and pompous rhetoric is suspiciously reminiscent of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Even the strikes which dominated the headlines throughout the decade are depicted in part 4, when the underground rebels encourage all workers to cease their toil for the company. Such themes were recognisable for a viewing audience of 1977. The national mood of depression and resignation, due to the aforementioned strikes and inflation, is evidenced in the serial. From the initial scene of exploited D-grade worker Cordo, whose financial situation drives him to suicide, to the PMC gas excreted throughout the city to lower the mood and encourage cooperation, the bleak tone is extremely reminiscent of contemporary Britain. It's epitomised when Leela asks the Doctor whether taxes are like sacrifices to gods. Well, roughly speaking, but paying taxes is more painful. Yet, such a response is uncharacteristic of the Doctor throughout the Sunmakers. The character is incredibly witty, both in Holmes' dialogue and Baker's performance. He is the Bohemian, continuously challenging authority. In turn, we are presented with an altogether different aspect of national identity, which the country had begun to define itself by. As a former imperial power that could no longer claim to rule the waves, Britain instead declared itself the land of wit and wry self-awareness. This tone had steadily become evident in previous stories of the season through Baker's performance, using his authorial presence to inject ad-libbed bizarre humour in rehearsals to make stories more off the wall and amusing. However, The Sunmakers is the first instance of such humour becoming noticeably incorporated into the script. Despite the grim theme of oppression, the serial is very comedic. Williams initially felt that Holmes had gone too far in this regard, believing he should have taken the edge off the script's comedy as the ground for that type of story hadn't quite been prepared yet. Yet Holmes incorporated this humour regardless, with such comedy often owing to the eccentricities of the Doctor. His interactions with the thuggish rebel leader Mandrel are perhaps the best example of this, the Doctor outwitting him with every retort. Ah, uh -uh, that's a cat's question, with a brain your size you don't think, right? It's here where we look to Barbara Selznick's brands of Britishness. In 2010, she posited that there are three brands of Britishness used to understand how a show exhibits its national identity. Two of the brands which she puts forward are that of the eccentric, which offers representations of a lack of conventionality and a questioning of authority, and cool, which deals with the world in an intelligent and witty manner, often with an anti-establishment stance. These brands provide a great lens through which to view Doctor Who. The quirky characterisation evident in Baker's Doctor, singled out by Williams as an outlying strength of British TV, aligns with the eccentric brand. The Doctor's idiosyncratic character can be interpreted as a British characteristic, representing the lack of conventionality which is prevalent in the eccentric brand. Furthermore, we can draw links to the cool brand, as Doctor Who deals with the issues it presents in an intelligent and witty manner, depicting the Doctor questioning authority with a sense of anti-establishment. His anti-authoritarianism has scarcely been more apparent than in The Sunmakers. From siding with the underdog... Why did you come here then? Hmm? Because my new little chum here seemed unhappy about something. A degrade? Yes. To encouraging the rebels by misquoting the Communist Manifesto. And what have we got to lose? 
Only your claims? Well put, Doctor. Oh, there's nothing. I have a gift for the appraise. This anti-establishment behaviour also reflects the notable change in the way Britain was seen. It was William's predecessor, Philip Hinchcliffe, who believed Baker's rebellious, individualistic doctor represented the general whittling down of Britain's world role after the decline of the British Empire. This dissolution of its position as an industrial world power encouraged the need for Britain to find a new collective cultural identity, not reliant upon its imperialist history or its power. A chance for a new notion of Britishness. And in presenting this new notion of Britishness for the show, quirky and non-conforming, the Sunmakers unintentionally became a blueprint for what was to come. With Williams admitting that the decision to continue utilising elements of sophisticated humour seen in the serial was not accidental. The serial illustrated Williams' recognition of Doctor Who's strength as a British TV property, with the show's conscious exploration of national identity seeing the tentative merging of sci-fi and comedy, opening the door for further experimentation with genre. The second serial of Doctor Who's 16th season, The Pirate Planet, first aired from the 30th of September to the 21st of October 1978. The season saw Graham Williams incorporate the show's first series arc, with a continuous thread concerning the Doctor's quest to reassemble a key to time, a device capable of restoring balance in the universe. In The Pirate Planet, the search for the second segment of the key leads the Doctor and new companion Romana to Kaliofax, a planet that the TARDIS can't seem to land on. They instead find themselves on Xanak, a hollow planet which can materialise around other planets to extract their mineral wealth, piloted by a fearsome pirate captain. It's here where the show's newfound appreciation of its eccentric and cool brands of Britishness see an enhanced use of genre hybridity in a further attempt to differentiate itself. It's first worth addressing that a notable impact on genre practices within the Williams era came as a result of the campaigns of Mary Whitehouse, founder of the National Viewers and Listeners Association. For years, she criticised Doctor Who for its corrupting influence in desensitising children to violence, citing Hinchcliffe's era as a particular offender, whose tenure saw gothic horror as the conspicuous secondary genre. It was in fact in response to Whitehouse's frequent complaints that the BBC hired Williams in Hinchcliffe's place, insisting a reduction in the amount of violence and cautious management of tonality. So cautious, in fact, that they told Williams to go further than simply toning down the realistic horror and actually clean it up. This goes some way in explaining the greater trend towards comedy throughout Williams' series, as was already apparent in The Sunmakers. The gradual removal of horror elements left a void to be filled by an increased use of humour. Williams indeed claimed that the turn to comedy was directly related to the White House attack. It was replacing the violence. That was a very, very major part of the thinking. Because in a thriller situation, if you can't have the nasties, it's a vacuum. You've got to have something in there. The show has always had the capacity for fusing genres though. Its primary sci-fi genre provides both the narrative conceit of time travel, which allows endless possibility in setting, genre and tone, and the TARDIS, a formatting vehicle for entwining multiple genres. Acknowledging this facility to mix genre conventions as a reason for the show's longevity, Williams would tap into popular genre trends in order to grab other audiences on the wing of Doctor Who's bedrock audience. I would try seeing what paperbacks were shifting, across the board, not just science fiction, and then paid attention to what science fiction was going. I reckoned that if people were committed enough to go out and buy the book, then they were likely to be committed enough to notice what was going on in the program. Hence, the entire concept of The Key to Time came out of the success of, and my own enjoyment in reading, science fiction sagas that had been selling terribly well. Such statements could suggest that it was also the epic narrative scope of Star Wars and popular sci-fi cinema that pushed Williams to employ this continuous epic narrative thread. Looking back at the Sunmakers, however, it was clear that this serial proved that Doctor Who was starting to realise its strength for quirky character, inadvertently laying the groundwork for a more prevalent secondary genre, comedy. The Pirate Planet demonstrates this movement. From even its opening scene, the larger-than-life pirate captain and his sidekick, Mr. Fibuli, indicate that the show is dialing up its comedic capabilities, their exchanges reflecting that of a double act. Excellent, Mr. Fibuli, excellent. Your death shall be delayed. Oh, thank you. Again and again, sir. 
Your goodness confounds me. Through small character interactions, such as the Doctor's farcical failure to get passers-by to answer him, to large concepts like the whimsical idea of a hollow planet, newcomer and writer of the serial Douglas Adams fuses the comedy genre with sci-fi, with a greater weighting towards the secondary genre to an extent not previously seen in Doctor Who. Famed for creating the sci-fi comedy The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the radio scripts for which he wrote alongside the pirate planet, Adams injects similar absurd humour throughout. The robot parrot, or polyphase Abatron, is perhaps the best summation of his ability to merge the sci-fi and comedy genres. The robot parrot idea, I must admit, was mine. I thought of it just before lunch, actually. I'd just finished a scene and thought that it seemed a bit dull. We want something really silly in it, so how about a robot parrot? I left that note for myself to discover after lunch. I came back and thought, God, don't be stupid. But then I thought, why not? By incorporating the comedy genre, a genre especially suited to hybridization, largely as laughter can be inserted into most other contexts without disturbing a genre's conventions, the show distances itself from the singular sci-fi genre of Star Wars and other contemporary sci-fi properties. By exercising its capacity for genre hybridity, Doctor Who differentiates itself from the singular genre properties, inviting further discussion beyond simply that of its primary sci-fi genre. A notable moment that illustrates this within the pirate planet can be found in part 3, when the captain shows the Doctor what becomes of all the planets he plunders, seeking appreciation for his technical achievement. I'm gratified that you appreciate it. Appreciate it? Appreciate it? But you commit mass destruction and murder on a scale that's almost inconceivable and you ask me to appreciate it just because you happen to have made a brilliantly conceived toy out of the mummified remains of planets! Terrible storms, Doctor! It is not a toy! What's it for? Having lulled the audience into complacency with comic genre tendencies throughout the serial, Adams employs this sudden shift in the Doctor from comedic and flippant to fiercely moralistic to highlight the broad discourse and discussion that this practice of genre fusing offers. It's worth noting that fusing comedy with any genre can be deemed as parody, a mode of genre mixture between comedy and a host genre. The resulting humour stems from the ridiculing of the host genre conventions. Parody sends up these conventions to expose the genre's absurdities and make us laugh. As such, Williams was keen to insert some feeling that parts of the script were not to be taken too seriously, because the Doctor had dealt with this situation a thousand times before and come out of it perfectly well. This notion can also be deemed as part of the meta sci-fi movement. Meta, or modernist sci-fi, has been summarised as laying bare the conventions of sci-fi by employing a self-reflexive discourse, aware of its own artificiality. Components of fiction such as character and plot are handled with aesthetic self-consciousness, so that audiences take them for what they actually are, created literary characters and made-up plots. Doctor Who, under Williams, embodies this concept. The pirate planet even features a moment in part two in which the Doctor turns to the camera to directly address it, breaking the fourth wall. 543.72. That's what I thought. Something that Baker had previously done not two stories ago in The Invasion of Time. Even the sonic screwdriver won't get me out of this one. The fourth story of the season, The Androids of Tara, goes even further. Borrowing narrative devices from its source text, The Prisoner of Zender, it actively comments on the fact that it's doing so. The Doctor quickly picks up on the familiarity of Prince Reynard's plan. Ah, I see. Let him attack George here instead of the Prince. Precisely. We use George, the android copy of me, to create a diversion, to distract their attention. To draw their fire. To draw their fire, while we slip past the guards into the coronation room. What do you think, Doctor? Well, it has been done before. Admitting to using this concept in Doctor Who, Adams argued that in taking this meta sci-fi approach, his intention was never to send up the show, but rather critique its stale, aliens seek to rule the universe sci-fi theme. In some instances, this could be considered unsuccessful. Adams' trivialisation of the title monsters in the following season's Destiny of the Daleks, which depicted them as laughably incapable robots who couldn't even climb the stairs, sought to be a humorously logical comment on Doctor Who's commitment to plausibility and realism. But it in fact drew attention to the lack of and inability for action drama within the show, demystifying one of the show's most revered creations in the process. However, there are many instances where the meta sci-fi approach could be considered beneficial for Doctor Who, particularly throughout the Key to Time season. In the season opener, The Ribos Operation, Robert Holmes deconstructs the entire premise of the series arc, 
The task to seek the key is all but forced upon the Doctor, who rejects the notion of a fundamental balance in the universe as no more than an old legend and a myth. It's almost a humorous reaction against Star Wars, and its devotion to its Manichaean view of the universe, in which the forces of good and evil must be balanced. Thus, Doctor Who used its meta-sci-fi capabilities to both differentiate and actively challenge concurrent sci-fi narratives. Already we can see that two seasons into William's run, many methods of differentiation had been employed. Both its national identity and genre mixing capabilities were emphasised, showing that Doctor Who acknowledged that whilst it could not compete with Star Wars, it could instead challenge its singular sci-fi genre practices. Something which William's final season saw perfected. The second serial of Doctor Who's 17th season, City of Death, first aired from the 29th of September to the 20th of October 1979. The Doctor takes Romana on a holiday to present-day Paris. However, their plans are quickly disrupted when they become embroiled in a mystery involving time experiments, the last of the Jagaroth, and seven identical Mona Lisas. It's also worth noting that this is the season which saw Douglas Adams inducted as script editor, leading him to incorporate his authorial influence, seen in the Pirate Planet, throughout the season. A season which proved that Williams had firmly established his practices within Doctor Who, capitalising upon the show's concepts of national identity and genre hybridity in order to differentiate from the surrounding sci-fi. Credited under the pseudonym David Agnew, City of Death was written by both Adams and Williams after initial drafts written by David Fisher didn't meet their requirements. It's a story which sees the show working just as Williams and Adams wanted it, with the producer considering it his personal favourite among his productions. We can deem, therefore, that City of Death provides us with a clear representation of Williams' vision for Doctor Who. Often regarded the wittiest Doctor Who story, the serial sees the show at its most comedic and self-referential, and full-on eccentric to boot. The Doctor embodies the stereotypical associations of eccentricity throughout, taking pride in being wacky or harmlessly bloody-minded, as he simultaneously clowns and saves the world. His pronouncement of the Mona Lisa as one of the greatest treasures of the universe in the crowded Louvre is just one substantiation of this. The world, Doctor, the world. What are you talking about? Not the universe in public, Doctor. It I don't care, attention. look, it's one of the great treasures of the universe. I don't care, let them gawp, let them gape, what do I care? Romana's acknowledgement of the Doctor's wording also highlights the importance of language throughout the serial. Characters are incredibly dexterous with their words. The villain of the piece, Scaroth, recognises the Doctor's skill with words, to such an extent that he threatens to disarm him of it. If he wags his tongue, confiscate it. How can I talk if you confiscate it? You can write, can't you? This trait isn't just seen as witty, but also British, advocating triumph through brains rather than brawn, and therefore mocking American blunt literal speech and brute force. In this regard, the detective Duggan, whilst a British character, could certainly be coded as an American stereotype. You can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. If you wanted an omelette, I'd expect to find a pile of broken crockery, a cooker in flames, and an unconscious chef. It's therefore a humorous subversion for such a British story, where quick talking and thinking is championed, to conclude with an action of brute force when Duggan punches Scarroth to defeat him. Duggan! Duggan! Duggan was possibly the most important punch in history. Another apparent inversion of the show's national identity is the serial setting. With the majority set in Paris, one might argue that this disables any capacity to express the national story. However, when we observe the events in Britain during the serial's broadcast, the narrative suggests otherwise. Having recently seen the first elections of the European Parliament, Britain was somewhat sceptical of European interference. Thus, we could make an interpretation that this serial, regarding a duplicitous alien from the continent, concerns the apparent threat that Europe posed to Britain's independence. As such, Paris actually refocuses the viewer's attention to Britain. Even devoid of a British setting, Doctor Who retains an awareness of its national roots through allegorical representation of Britain. And yet the depiction of Britain in City of Death has evolved much from the grim tone seen in The Sunmakers. One might have expected the bleak nature of 1979 to be reflected in City of Death in a similar fashion. However, despite the apparent allegorical concern with contemporary Britain within this serial, there is no reflection of the dreadful winter of discontent that Britain was living through at the time. A crisis which began in January of that year and saw strikes that led to a national fuel and food shortage and, in turn, nationwide despair. By contrast, City of Death and its surrounding season sees the programme lighter than ever, 
with exaggerated performances from the cast of Creature from the Pit, and a pantomime-esque villain played by Graham Crowden in The Horns of Nymon. It's a likeness that the country demanded in such grim times, reflecting Britain's national identity through its quirky character rather than simply allegory. As a result, in similar fashion to the pirate planet, City of Death never feels fit to take itself too seriously and openly flirts with its unreality. Should we take the lift or fly? Let's not be ostentatious. All right, let's fly then. That would look silly. We'll take the lift. Come on. Just like we saw in the pirate planet, much of this can be attributed to Adam's meta sci fi approach. Williams certainly allowed for this fully aware of Adam's style when appointing him a script editor, as he believed that any bonus audiences could be captured by his parody approach, by interspersing humour throughout the horror, such as the brief insertion of British comedy star John Cleese as an art critic. The inclusion of Cleese is in itself a signifier of genre merging. The actor is very much of the comedy genre due to his associations with Monty Python and Faulty Towers. Williams is once again fusing genres, through weaving in elements of previously successful TV to maximise audiences, something that the incoming showrunner, John Nathan Turner, would be highly criticised for. It's been suggested that fusing genres leads to greater foregrounding of genre practices, as the combination of different assumptions makes genre conventions more manifest and explicit. Adams is definitely doing as such here, encouraged by Williams. As a result, Doctor Who becomes more self-aware in terms of both itself and the sci-fi genre once again distancing itself from singular sci-fi properties and distinguishing itself from its competitors. In his book Inside the TARDIS, James Chapman deemed that the show's strategy of product differentiation during this era was merely its stressing of its quirky characteristics. However, I'd go one further. It was a combination of the show's signifiers of its quirky national identity and developed practices of genre hybridity, which characterised Doctor Who and became crucial to its impact. As such, you could say that Star Wars in fact had a positive influence on this era of Doctor Who, forcing it to recognise its strengths and champion story over spectacle, by encouraging a greater distinction of character and innovation in contrast. By employing this greater use of genre hybridity and national identity, Doctor Who found an identity that was both unique and of broad appeal. But just how great was the impact which Williams' approach had? Okay, it's time to consider the facts. Let's first look to the elevated viewing figures that the show was receiving. Because the series ratings were often breaking the 10 million barrier throughout Williams' tenure, peaking with a record high of 16.1 million for part four of City of Death, a figure to be recognized despite the slight inflation due to a strike which had taken ITV off the air. The rising appreciation index for Williams' three seasons further supports this, averaging at 62, 64, and 65 respectively, and furthering the 59 of Hinchcliffe's final season, indicating that audiences didn't hold Williams' era in any lower regard. However, concurrent discourse vocalised by the fandom may have suggested otherwise. Prolific fan Ian Levine believed that Williams was displacing the coherent fictional world of the programme for comedy, referring to it as slapstick faulty towers in space, whilst others claimed that the undergraduate humour of Adams was alienating audiences. We have to remember though that this isn't fact, but discourse, since it depends on the fans' social assumptions and values. Besides, the aforementioned large viewing figures would dispute the fans' notion that the humour was estranging viewers, perhaps conversely being in tune with their tastes. This notion is further evidenced by a downturn in popularity in the 1980s, with the show's viewing figures dropping alarmingly to a minimum of just 3.7 million for Baker's final season in 1981, when the series took a more serious approach under J&T, who ensured that the humour was used very sparingly to avoid what he saw as the childish silliness of Williams' era. The large viewership certainly suggests that Williams had managed to build on the show's bedrock audience, not only retaining viewers, but appealing to others through understanding its cross-generational appeal. In an interview taken for the Sunday Express, Baker recognised this cross-generational appeal too. One of the surprising things about Doctor Who is the range of the audience. Although I've always thought of it as a children's programme, not a childish programme, mind you, we have a big adult audience. And over the past two years, we've discovered that there are a lot of Doctor Who fan clubs at the universities. I was astonished to be invited to St. John's and Somerville Colleges at Oxford, and spoke to absolutely packed halls. If I accepted all of the invitations, I could be going to the universities three or four times a week. This diverse audience is not surprising, given William's approach. 
He made many further attempts to ignite interest in specific sectors of the audience, such as children via the introduction of K9, who Williams incorporated to give younger viewers something to find more of a friend. He acknowledged the student interest in the show's tendency to the bizarre by integrating Adam's self-reflective humour and self-referential tendencies. Even the adult audiences referred to by Baker were targeted and maintained by an appeal to audience sophistication by means of its allegorical mode of address as was seen in The Sunmakers. This wide audience reached by the show is certainly a measure of the impact that Williams' strategies achieved. Furthermore, the impact that Williams' era left can be seen through its influence upon the revival of the show in 2005. Russell T Davis retains Williams' use of genre hybridity and Britishness, inserting moments of knowing humour for levity, as well as allegorical storylines that reflected modern-day Britain. For instance, the comedy-infused chase sequence in Love and Monsters, in which the Doctor and Rose flee from the hoiks, is a self-aware reference to the iconography of Scooby-Doo, and there's a clear political satire in the form of the Slovene, farting aliens disguised as politicians in 10 Downing Street in Aliens of London. We can even extend Williams' influence to Davies' successor, Stephen Moffat, whose era utilises the meta-sci-fi practices incorporated by Douglas Adams, thus providing a clear reflection of the approach that Williams had polished by his final season. Meta-sci-fi is utilised by Moffat in almost every episode of his era, even until one of his last. World Enough and Time sees Missy mockingly pretend to be the Doctor, exiting the TARDIS proclaiming, I'm Doctor Who, and introducing her plucky assistants, Exposition and comic relief. Totally outlining the structure of the show in the process. Moffat also incorporates numerous instances whereupon the Doctor breaks the fourth wall, in much the same fashion as Baker, such as when Peter Capaldi gives a fleeting glance to the camera in Heaven Sent, asserting, I'm nothing without an audience. It's an entirely self referential statement, drawing attention to the Doctor as a fictional television character. On a performance, design, and character level, the influence of the fourth Doctor can also be felt through the ninth. Just as Baker represented the post-colonial sentiments, the look, personality and demeanour of Eccleston also reflects the nature of contemporary Britain. Eccleston's minimalist contemporary look of his leather jacket and plain trousers felt pared back and free from the trappings of his past. This is reinforced by the character's narrative desperation to suppress his past experience of the Time War and forge a new identity, as well as Eccleston's use of his regional northern accent in contrast to the previous Doctor's received pronunciation. Paralleling this, Britain was similarly dissociating itself from its past, in terms of the colonialisation and exploitation which had been the hallmark of its historical representation, attempting to distance itself from this, much like Eccleston's Doctor. We can also draw attention to Davies' dual address to both established and new audiences. It was Williams who pioneered this approach, seeking ways of gaining audience members on the wing of their loyal fans. The influence of Williams is widely felt throughout the subsequent runs of Doctor Who. It's undeniable how impactful his polished approach was. Williams' time on the show is so often looked down upon. Sure, your invisible enemies and Nightmare of Edens aren't going to win any awards, but not every story can be City of Death, let's be frank. Because what he did was far more important than that. As a result of external factors, mainly Star Wars, impacting upon the landscape of sci-fi media, Williams devised a new approach for Doctor Who which would convey its strength for character through greater use of national identity and genre hybridity. From The Sunmakers, which illustrated his recognition of Doctor Who's ability to express the national story through both allegory and its eccentric and cool brands of Britishness, to The Pirate Planet, which saw Douglas Adams consciously incorporate comedy as a secondary genre, introducing parody and meta-sci-fi concepts, actively challenging the nature of the sci-fi genre. City of Death marked the point where the show had really found its new identity, with Williams establishing Doctor Who's concept of Britishness and genre hybridity as its strategy of product differentiation. In combating the new wave of sci-fi spearheaded by Star Wars, Williams recognised Doctor Who's strength as a British TV property with quirky character, and thus found what made it unique and, consequently, of broad appeal. His practices proved highly successful in the ratings, and influenced the Doctor Who we see today. The use of his strategies in future popular iterations of the show, such as RTD's era, is testimony to the impact that his established approach had. And with Davies returning to the role of showrunner in 2023, one can only imagine that he'll retain the elements of Williams' approach, which he employed within his previous run from 2005. As such, we should expect that however different and experimental it may seem, 
the era of our incoming Doctor Shuti Gatwa will retain that identity which Williams developed and refined for Doctor Who throughout his tenure, ensuring that the producer's time on the show is never forgotten. So here's to you, Graham Williams, the producer who fought Star Wars, who devised robot docks, ice maidens and keys to time, and who established a refined, popular format for Doctor Who, going unnoticed for doing so. Well, thanks for watching that video essay. Something very new for me, but an absolute joy to make all the same. Um, I was very keen to turn what was my final university dissertation into something for everyone to experience, so I hope you've all enjoyed it. Do give a sub if you haven't already, and if you like what you see, you can chuck a few coins my way on Kofi. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next one.